So good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sarah Vogelman. I'm the Assistant Curator of Fine Art here at the New Jersey State Museum, and I'm the curator of this show, the 2022 New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence. Um, and we're here today for a series of artist talks. There's one each month through the run of the exhibition at the end of April. Um, and yeah, the, this is a great opportunity for our public to connect with artists featured in the exhibition um, in person, as well as over Instagram Live and on our recorded talks on YouTube. Um, so yeah, today we are here with two wonderful artists, Megan Klim and Katrina Bayo. Um, is it Bello or Bayo? I'm sorry. Oh, that's it. It's neither. It's <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's it's uh, apparently it's it's that's the common pronunciation, yeah. Bello or Bayo. But uh, in my country, where I'm from orig originally from, we pronounce it as Bello. Bello. I okay. don't know who else. I don't know if anybody knows any other. Place that pronounce it that way. Um, oh wow! So, well, yeah, it's really Katrina Bingo. All right. I just, yeah, I should have asked you before, but now everyone gets to learn something. Or we could too. be wrong. We could have been completely <laughs> botching. <laughs> no, <laughs> fantastic. So yeah, welcome Megan and welcome Katrina. Um, just a few thank yous before we start. Um, I need to mention that the 2022 New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence is a project of the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the New Jersey State Museum. Funding for the New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence has been made possible in part by funds from the New Jersey, Council, New Jersey State Council on the Arts and has received additional support from the New Jersey State Museum Foundation through the Lucille M. Paris Fund. Um, but yeah, let's get on with our talk, and I'll give some brief introductions first. Um, Megan Klim is a mixed media artist based in Jersey City. Her work just juxtaposes materials in a way that highlights their physical attributes and textures. Her goal is that through her tangible surfaces, she can create an ethereal surface, ethereal space that is felt and not just seen. Megan received her MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art in the discipline of painting and has exhibited widely, widely in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Florida. Katrina Bello <laughs> is uh, born in the Philippines and is based in New Jersey and Metro Manila area um, in the Philippines. And uh, her work is informed by her experiences in nature throughout the course of her travels and migration. She received her BFA from the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers and her MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. She has participated in many solo and group exhibitions in the US and the Philippines and is the founder of North Willow, an informal artist-run exhibition space in Montclair that is you know, doing things virtually <laughs> these days. Um, so please welcome me in, in I mean, so I said this last time, Please join me in, in welcoming um, Katrina and Megan to our galleries. First of all, thank you very much, Sarah, for inviting me to this talk. And thank you for people who are here. Um, this is my piece, Permutations Vessel, and it is encaustic medium ink on a wood panel. So the interesting fact about this piece is that once we shut down, I'm a teacher, and we had to do work with the students at home. Now, some of the academic classes were a little concerned about cheating and whatever, and of course the art teachers were concerned about how are we going to get the materials to the students, how are we going to keep them busy. And it actually worked out really well to some extent because they had to upload what they did and so they were always busy working. You could see the tops of their heads working. So as they were working, I started looking around my studio and I had this wood, wooden panel on my wall forever and it had like a maybe a little bit of something on the top and nobody was really going out and buying art supplies during that time. I mean, Home Depot in my area in Jersey City, there was a line to get in there. I mean, you know, it was ridiculous. So you start, I started to look around and see what did I have in my studio? What could I use? 
and you, it's funny how you become very uh, thrifty, or not even thrifty, but you start scrounging around and you start picking up projects that you thought you would never finish. So I scraped off what was on there, well, actually I didn't finish that one, and I covered it with my medium as I usually do with this type of work. And I think I started in this area in the middle, and from the middle out, and I just started to make boxes and fill them in very slowly with uh, a quill. I use a quill, dipping it into a, a glass jar, and laid it flatly on my studio table and drew. It was really convenient because as my students were working, I could visit it each day. I could pay attention to what they were doing, and I, I felt I didn't have to think that much. Um, it's funny how I told myself that, maybe because of what was happening around us and we just wanted to zone out. So I would come to it each day, do another line, maybe two lines, and just pick up where I left off. I didn't worry about color, I didn't worry about really meaning. Um, I would just continue with it, with this very mindless yet purposeful, at the same time, drawing on this panel. Now, of course, when it started to grow, I thought, oh my god, I'm making a mask. Um, I wasn't making a mask. Uh, but it, but I couldn't really deny the shape of it, although I've had work before that was vessel shapes. I have had that before. So the vessel is always an important shape for me. And I stopped a little bit about it because even though I wanted to be mindless, I also was, didn't want to replicate it being a thing. Uh, although a vessel is a thing, I want it to be an open-ended type thing. So, I guess these little sheets were like cloth or fibers too. I am a mixed media fiber artist as well, so it sort of mimics the little particles that you would have with cloth and just little microcosms that make a whole. So it was very, um, I did come across some when I got to about halfway up, and I thought, let me gather it, you know. So when I think about my work, I can go back to graduate school and where I went, we would have each teacher from a different discipline come into your studio. I was in a school that had metals, uh, fiber, ceramics. And that was always an interesting experience because you would be, as a painter, I would have uh, different, totally different teachers come in and look at my work. And one thing stuck with me, and it was the architecture teacher, believe it or not. And he said to me, when he saw my body of work at the time, that was sort of sculptural, had cloth, it was a mix between painting, it was, is it a thing? And he would say to me, you need to decide whether your work's a noun or a verb. And I thought, that like stuck, stuck with me for a long time. And I thought, well, I don't really want it to be a noun. I want it to show that it's doing something. And it, it's really like guided my practice for a long time, well, still. So, it, I call it a vessel, but it's about the gathering. It's about how it's loose. I want my work to have something that is doing. So that's what this permutations piece is about. Um, you know, I look back on it, and I just look at it as a recording of the minutes and the days when we really weren't leaving our homes very much. And I thought, do, you, do I really want to revisit that? But you know, it, it's good to revisit those times and think about how you really do, you can get very mindful too, because you're sitting over something, and because I had to do this flatly because of the ink, and you're just really getting engaged and engaged, and just kind of losing yourself in this process. My work is totally process driven. My new work is now like taking thin pieces of plaster and weaving them in wire. It's sort of the same type of sitting in front of, and maybe I'll only get about you know, this much done in a, in a day. Mm. So, does anybody have any questions about this piece, or? Yeah, I, I, I No, no, go for it. Yeah, I, I have a few questions about, you know, in, in caustic as a medium, is in painting, it's very specific and has a really long history. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what it is for people and why you choose to, to work in it? Uh, I'm using caustic not in the traditional sense. Um, 
There's very little color in my encaustic work. This is basically the, just the medium with the varnish. I use it as a ground. I like the, the fattiness of it, I guess you could say. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of texture if you feel it, and even where the ink starts, it's all rough because I'm using that quill and it's digging into it. So I use encaustic as a type of ground, and if I do use color, it's thin layers with shellac that you can see through, and it sort of gives it this, uh, it's sort of, I like the layers of it. So traditional encaustic is really a little more laborious, frankly. I got as people have like 10 million pans set up and you know, this color and you know, the heat gun all the time. I do use a heat gun here and there to set it, but I basically use a, a white layer over things and I like to work on it. So. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's, it's um, rather than like an oil-based paint or a wa water-based paint, um, it's wax. So melted wax and pigment, right. usually. Right, um, it's beeswax, the, the basic uh, medium, this is the medium, is beeswax with uh, Demar varnish. And you mix it up and you know you have like eight uh, whatever ounces to two ounces of the varnish and you melt it down and create your medium. So I always have a big a pan of that going and very limited color with the wax itself, the beeswax itself. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you heard about encaustic? And I just ask because, you know, it's, it is an ancient medium that goes back to, the you know, Greeks. The, yeah, Greeks the Greeks and, but then it also has, you know, with, there are many modern artists and contemporary artists who have taken up encaustic, you know, like Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg. Right. So there's, you know, kind of this more recent tradition as well. Um, and I, yeah, I'm sort of probably, curious about your connection to I it. probably started using it in graduate school, and where I lived, there literally was a beekeeper in the neighborhood. Oh, wow. And I bought like a big chunk of the um, unbleached wax, which is that beautiful honey color. And I might even have a chunk of it left still. Uh, but now I buy the uh, bleached, so it's more white. And I started using it just because I've always used, I like different materials. I've used almost everything you can think of. I really have. And I liked having them, I stuck with the beeswax because you can use it as a nice coloring, a nice layering. Um, it works great with shellac. So, you know, I just always liked it as a ground. I still use it to this day. Yeah. That's so special. It's from the yeah, the, from the local beekeeper. I love that. Yeah, he was an architect, I believe. Huh? And apparently, right, uh, Rich? I think he was an architect when we bought that beeswax. Um, he and he used it in his model making or, or something with architecture. That's fabulous. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, that's great. Yeah, go ahead, thank you. Right. And so that's one, one comment because I, I think a lot of artists, certainly in my experience, was that the labor of our making changed tremendously during COVID. You know, we did get slower, at least I did, I'll speak for myself. I got slower, more intentional, more closer, and I see all that happening with your piece. The other, the other comment I have is, is about the, the sort of mesh, and you know, yes, as a vessel, you're speaking to a solid kind of experience or collaboration, but more specifically to that, they also feel like pieces of gauze, and they mm -hmm. speak to manufacturing with like chain link fence um, and things like that, and the two that, that it can bring to my mind, both those things, one very fragile uh, and, and the other not, and sort of uh, again to the manufacturing of each of those other things. Uh, it, yeah, that's just the connection uh, I had with the piece, and I thought that was interesting because also those are about construction, right? Right. Uh, about fabric and all that, and anyway, it's so rigid. Not it, it's not rigid, but it's tight. The, the sort of columns of information are closer and tighter at the top, and they're falling away. It just gives it such a buoyancy, and, and um, as if it's a piece of gauze and wind. 
and so we get the very opposite of my sense of what a festival is. Mm, right, right. So I, that's just my And I do, I, I have bolts of gauze in my studio. I use them a lot. So, yes. I was sort of interested in like the moments where the ink becomes so saturated that it's like like at the, at the very top, the edges, and the two, uh, I guess, like cheek, yeah. the middle center where this ink becomes black, and then these little lines that float off the edge. So, I mean, these things kind of seem accidental, but I can tell that they're very intentional, so at some point they must have had to step back and look at the whole thing. So I wanted to know, like, how, like, you know, a little bit about the process of playing with it and making things dark and playful, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, I'm a big believer in the devils and the details and those small little signposts when you're looking through, a, uh, looking at a piece of art that's kind of regular yet irregular at the same time. Um, I just think it goes back to that verb thing too. I wanted to get the illusion that this was almost folding, mm -hmm. so I needed to. Uh, Put less circles there and more, and gather more at this, you know, put more closer together to show that gradient. Um, when it got to the very top, see, I, the, to me, I love that edge. Like, to, that that's edge. my favorite part. Yeah, like little things like that. Thank you. And um, I also was very interested in the spaces between everything. Uh, I think those things make a piece really keeps people engaged with that because you're picking up the little shapes in here. And as far as the lines go, I love line. And there's always some kind of line in my work, even if it's an underneath structure. Uh, another thing I did learn too is I'm very interested in gesture versus structure. I love having the two interplay with each other. And if it's not different materials, because this is just really just ink, and it is the encaustic too, but it's mostly ink. Most of my other works have at least three materials that play against each other. Yeah. What is the wood that you use that it's mounted on? And is it solid through and through, or is it just a frame? Oh, yeah. it's a. It's. I make the frame. Okay. It's you know, piece of wood, and it's just regular plywood you would get at Home Depot. It's plywood. Yeah. yeah, like a you know, not a super thin one, but not that well thick stuff either. Okay. Um, just regular wood that I just cut to whatever. I know sometimes people have concerns about humidity changes and mm -hmm. splitting the actual art piece. But yeah, I've never it's experience. never seemed to have any kind of issue with it because everything's kind of really nailed down mm -hmm. as far as that goes. And um, there's also a shellac covering a lot of this too, so it's very protective. Sure, yeah. and the wax base I'm sure is you know. Nice. I'm, I'm curious, I know you said you were doing this while you were teaching. Right. But how long did it take you to finish this? Uh, maybe a couple weeks. Um, of working every day? Yeah, working every day. Um, the, the fun part too is I have all, I teach all different levels. I teach in all, boy, all boys high school in Jersey City. And um, the freshmen, you kind of have to pay attention to more. Uh, sophomore, same thing. But I have an upper level class that's a portfolio level, and they do their own curriculum. And they all built little studios in their house, whether it was their bedroom, the kitchen. So I would hook my camera up to where I, where, you know, where I was, and they were watching me work as I was watching them. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a nice shared experience together. And they were like, oh, I remember when you made that? Because I saw it online or something. And uh, I said, yeah, that was the one I was making when you guys were making your work. So, that's so special. Yeah, I'm curious. Oh, go ahead, Donna. Remember when you were doing that on social media? Mm -hmm. <laughs> video of me doing that yeah. on Instagram and you wrote back on yeah. you wrote back. I love the sound of the, you yes. know, the oh, yeah. quill scratching oh, on wow. the thing and I was like, yeah, me too. Um, 
No, I don't really do much printmaking or anything like that, but it kind of reminds me of like tattoo, because sometimes if I press hard enough, the ink will go, it'll inject underneath the wax. Hmm. It just does. And that's when you'll see some, some more uh, bloopy things too, to your question. Sometimes it just happens naturally, where the ink just will go underneath and spread a little bit, which is fine. It does, but then when you put the Damar varnish in, it changes it to a little more something, you know, more, yeah. But then, I, I don't know if I, if I smelled it now, would I smell it? I don't know. Um, I, it, it goes away after a while, to be honest with you. I love that we're getting the full sensory of the sound and the smell and the process. I love it. I really love it. Um, Megan, I was wondering, the, the title of the work is Permutations Vessel. You mm -hmm. talked about the vessel right. part of it. Um, I'm curious, because I think you do you also have a series of these permutations. Yes, yes. I have another piece I did that's a little bigger than this one during that same time. Uh -huh. And I, that, that was just permutation. Um, then I had smaller ones where I started with the little doodle circles and they kind of look like these growths of something, if you will. Um, and it took me a little bit of time to allow myself to do that. I, I think anybody here who's an artist and you love to doodle circles, but you know, you do it during meetings or whatever you're doing. And I thought, you know, I'm going, I'm just going to make work where I'm going to draw a bunch of circles. And I'm here. And so, voila. Uh, <laughs> That's what I did. I, I love little circles. That's what. That's my doodle. And this is. I allowed myself to have a series of those permutation circle works. Yes. And is that ongoing, or is that something kind of is um, confined to this time? I'm not in that series anymore. Yeah. I'm in something new, but you know, sometimes you go back to a combination of a couple series. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. If no, if no one else has a. Um, yeah, I was sort of curious about the the colors that you choose or the lack of color, and if you know if there's any significance to that, or yeah, what is, is you, a lot of your color is this sort of white encaustic in mm -hmm. the ground, um, you know, black ink. Sometimes there's browns um, that I see in any way. Right. So yeah, I'm curious about that. Uh, I I let go of color a while back because I want it to be about the materials, the white gauze, the wax, the rusted wire. I was mm -hmm. only interested in those things. I wasn't really interested in color. The color would be a natural color, like the rust from the wire, yeah. that type of thing. Um, this to me is really a drawing, I guess. So it's, it's on wood and it's got some heft to it. But, uh, so I don't really view it as a painting. I don't know, it's yeah. in between. It's hard to say what it is, you know? Um, but the series after these was a lot of bright color underneath, and then I layered the white and caustic over it, and then I took a, an awl or a pencil, and I dug out the repetition of, of circles or lines. And it, these pieces of bright color were coming through. And so that, so it's sort of like I dug the color out, I didn't put it on, I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And I've had people say, oh my god, your work's so full of color now. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, 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 I gotta back off on that. I, but it, it was what it was. But the color is just revealed. It's not on. Mm. So those, that was probably my most colorful series after, for, uh, recently. Yeah. And now I'm back to white again and just color as an accent. Yeah. I actually have a question. I do have works on paper, and I'm also making, I make handmade paper too, that I put on mesh screens, and it's a shape. Yeah, let's do these last two questions, perfect. Just, just really quickly, you are commenting about the, the white and black, and, and uh, in a graphic sense, when you think of that as being very cold, and your piece is anything but cold, and, and if you look around the gallery, you'll see things that actually are much whiter than what you're calling white. Space and that's uh, in my experience. Like when you started to talk about the work on paper, 
the, the quote unquote whiteness of your background can be almost anything, and it's rarely white. Right. Well, the, the beeswax will have a little bit of color and the shellac layer. Okay. Because the shellac, it, it gets a coating of shellac over it. You can't draw on wax. It's going to beat up. So you have to have, I have to have a, a, a little skin there that will yeah, deceive the ink. question that where yeah. the come from and so it's the shellac. Nice thing. Yeah, I, I think uh, when I, I have a series of works on paper, on pretty white paper, that has the gauze with wax. So you've got all these series of those different values of white. That's very simple. But yeah. Fantastic. I love having all these artists in the room. It makes the conversation so rich and wonderful. Um, great. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your thoughtful questions. Yes. outside of the hospital windows and this is the result and uh, it's an ongoing series and I'm not entirely sure where it will go towards but uh, it's a uh, it's kind of a project that I'm not surprised that uh, emerged during the pandemic but also emerged um, in within my practice uh, it's uh, like to put it uh, in brief, like what my artwork is about, what, what my studio practice is about, is really is, um, how I can use my, um, my like the media that I use, uh, which is primarily drawing, some video, a little bit of photography, and how I can use them to kind of embody or to put into visual form my 
my reflections and my ideas about not our complex relationship with the natural world, and its nature, environment. I call it complex because it's, we all love nature, right? Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but, but I think we all know too that the, there, it, there's a disconnect between our love for the environment and the, kind of the, the result, the, the state it is in right now, or the attitudes or the habits that we have are kind of not always in agreement with um, our sentiments. So that's uh, what my work is all, all about. The references I count on my work are, I use a lot of photography. I don't really have uh, training in photography, so I, uh, I use a lot of iPhone images and anything I shoot on my, my phone or my uh, instant cameras. Yeah. I use a lot of images in the internet. I use um, images from, um, like, from NASA and as the uh, sources for my work. Like my, my primary uh, medium is uh, drawing and make, usually make large and small drawings and, um, and they take a lot of time. So um, photography became, uh, my relationship with photography in the beginning was to capture like, things in the landscape or things in places that I use as references for my drawings that are mostly uh, executed in the studio solely but because the drawings take a very long time to make. Um, the more I counted the photos and so let's say the drawing takes around like six to seven months, my relationship to those photos becomes something else transformed because I'm beginning to have more relationship with the references of my work, the printed images that I have than the landscape that, that was a reference. So that's, I think, where my studio practice right now, beginning to look more into my references. Most of them are printed. Most of them are either in or, or videos of them or just internet sources. So the, my materials are becoming to be my more uh, uh, source of like inquiry right now, as well as the subject of these materials. So. Um, and this emerging for me is not as a sur it's not a surprise to me. It involves a lot. Just like my drawing is very physically involved, it's like a lot of touching. I don't really draw with a pencil like this. I draw with sort of my body and my hands. They're like hand drawings. Like uh, I put a lot. I like splash. I like, throw out or use sponges to throw out the like blobs of. Uh, pigment that you should crush pastels into and they're heavily working and just like how these images were made although they're printed in metal like I really crushed a lot of this but rubbing them into the lens of the phone sometimes if the gauze is not enough so um, and so that's where I am <laughs> so that's the, the whole process so it's an ongoing process and uh, now I'm the next stage of this series, actually, is um, shooting, uh, uh, photographing other parts of uh, the landscape that I'm visiting, uh, but also uh, uh, parts of bodies of my relatives. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. any questions? I'll, st I'll start off with questions. Sure. Um, just to clarify one first, so the, mm -hmm. on the gauze, you're putting the pigment, like pigment sort of powder mm -hmm. directly onto the Correct. lens. Okay. Yeah. And on the lens of the camera too sometimes. Because they end up when, uh, because this is a process that kind of learned on my own, yeah. they eventually end up on the lens. Sure. So, um, and when, uh, when I work, I use different colors. So there would be, the lens would end up with whatever powder from a previous colored gauze that I use. I one shot with a yellow gauze, and then when I wanted to shoot with a green colored gauze, there was a yellow pigment residue. Uh, residue. So, in uh, the image, had a little bit of yellow and a little bit of green. Um, 
it's not something I highly recommend because <laughs> it's really it's, it's it ends up in the lens of your phone. It is easy to clean, but um, the more I'm um, working on this process, the more I'm realizing, oh, this potential has hazards. You can breathe it through, so be careful with it if you decide to do it. But, um, I title it 12 ply because uh, it's uh, the it co it's called 12 ply design. This is the actual gauze that uh -huh. I actually use. It's CVS brand. It says a <laughs> so simple. Oh, wow. I'm sure I'm not the only one who struggles with titles of work, but uh, there you go. It's my title. <laughs> 12, uh, it's called 12 ply design. So yeah. So I want to show you how the gauze actually looks like. They're quite yeah. small because you just put it on the lens of your iPhone. So they're like this. And you're just holding it up. I'm just holding it up. Yeah. At one point, I, um, you could tape it. Okay. But it's not, it's synthetic. It's not, co um, uh, Megan, do you, is there the gauze that you use pure cotton? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it, it's for the, no, it's that, like a, a, a nicer, closer weave, because when you get that loose stuff, it's, it just falls apart. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's uh, like the, for, for a long time, that's the gauze. And then they make these synthetic materials, which is, pretty sure it's not great for the environment. <laughs> But uh, it's very fine, and uh, so this is what they use, right? So it, wow. th that hole is this hole where I put the, I do, uh, depending on the device that you use, I think any smartphone will do, maybe even, I haven't used it on my, uh, on my automatic camera yet, but it's, that's next. Yeah. It'll be probably harder to clean, so, mm. so that's, uh, that's the process. Good. Thanks for bringing us to show. I'm fascinated with the, the story behind the making of these, that you were in, you were in the pandemic and you're in the hospital, mm. and you're photographing out the window. Correct. So it's like you're looking towards the future or looking towards out the outdoors or something, and it's vague. I mean, it's, it's foggy. Whereas your larger work also is pretty clear. It's, it still has, it has this aspect mm -hmm. of, I don't want to say foggy, that's not the right word, soft there's a softness to the texture but this feels to me and when hearing where the place that it was made and the time that it was made just it fits it feels like it's like these were foggy times we're yeah living in. <laughs> yeah it was actually a very sunny day yeah. it's a very sunny day outside it's it's just it's just how how much pigment uh, these were just the blobs of the green pigment or the red and like, it just got, the more I use it, it just got dirtier and dirtier. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was mostly uh, around that time, a very sunny day. And it's, uh, it's just the, uh, the colored gauze that's concealing or making it, giving it this very um, like foggy, really almost like darkness to it. Yeah. So, um, but those were foggy times, it's true. Do you remember if, this, if these were taken the same day? Um, this is the only one, this is for early morning. These were the same day. Okay. Yeah. And uh, hospital windows there, um, I don't know how often they clean. It could be clean inside, but outside it is dirty. <laughs> so, so I'm sure it's- uh, Filters on filters. Yeah, <laughs> filters and filters. Yeah. There you go. So that's another uh, layer of filter yeah. adding to it. Well, they're landscapes. I mean, they feel, I just feel the tree in that one. And you could see, you feel like you see things coming through without necessarily knowing exactly what Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's landscape. Right? It was shot around February and January. So there's, um, I actually uh, went back and I couldn't, it's, of course, it's a hospital room. I have no access to it anymore. But I tried to shoot it again during, um, uh, when there's leaves in the trees, then it loses that, uh, mm. that linear quality, then it's just, just the uh, yeah. just blocks so of um, you can't even see the color of the trees. So it really works just for if you want the lines to emerge. Uh, so, but it's a uh, yeah, it's a process. We'll see. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a comment about uh, this this notion about uh, your camera and the way smartphones are now mm -hmm. and the way they work as automatic filtering devices. Mm -hmm. And then this other filter that you've created mm -hmm. outside the phone, and so in a way you're challenging that that tool that you're using 
by creating this other filter outside. Another one, yes. Right, a second filter. But it also, because it, following Donna's comment about your setting, it, when I first looked at them, I was thinking about, you know, x-ray imagery, mm -hmm. you know? That, that has this mm -hmm. sense of, of, for us that are medical professionals, mm -hmm. we have a sense of what the thing is, but we don't really know what we're looking at, and so there's yet another filter. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes, especially the blue. It's a well, it, it goes yeah. beyond that for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm a landscape-based inspired mm -hmm. artist as well, so I'll see landscape and things that other people won't, as far as sort of an abstracted image. But then there's another thing. And that is, uh, when you were talking about using your hand, one of the things, when I saw that, I thought, you know, these images could have been made with fine layers of paper on the hand and just rubbing into the surface, you know, building up layers and density, you know? And so, in a way, although your hand wasn't involved on the surface, I still feel your hand. Yeah. <laughs> When I look at these, I sort of think about like, well, obviously accessibility, and one of the one of the first things you do when you're you're cutting off access to what you can see by putting that, with the gauze over it. But you know, um, these images, even though like they take on like a physically they're sort of foggy, but they also but what they do is that they force you to look at the same time. So it's not this quick. Oh, I get it. Move on. <laughs> now you gotta, now you gotta spend the good, you know, 10, 20 minute, whatever. You, you gotta stop and look if you want. If you, you gotta give this thing, give these images something if you want to get something back from them. And so I'm, I'm sort of interested in, like, did you think about, like, well, I want, you, like, I want you to work for this. I want, I don't want to give it up that easy. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah. Oh, I completely understand. It's it's uh. And uh, if not for the circumstances that I was in back then, like having a sick relative, and then um, there were, yeah, around that time, vaccines were already out, so um, you know we felt safer. But um, I don't know I would if I would have come up with this process if it wasn't in that that really uh, like the, that you know that that crisis. Um, and, I don't know if there was a way to uh, to like, stay sane, <laughs> resist. Um, you know, uh, uh, I I I, um, I had ongoing work in my studio that I couldn't really uh, I couldn't really uh, execute. And uh, in the and right now it's still a foggy. I, fo I still have a foggy sense of what I really felt around that time. Um, that you know that made this emerge. Um, but uh, but uh, so when I when I was actually shooting uh, that one, it was it was a source of freedom. Yes. It was a sort of like my own, sort of like you know like uh, we, we didn't really have a timeline like okay when are we going to be out of this hospital? Mm -hmm. um, but it's like a day to day drug. So when shooting this, it was actually very liberating. Mm -hmm. um, freedom, like, freedom seems more like freedom comes from you enforcing your will on it. Like, I'm putting the gauze over this, and this is what I want to do. And it's going to be foggy and it's fine, so it seems like that. Right? Yeah, but also, like, most, those were clean gauze. Uh -huh. I, I was handling the, the bloody gauze, too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, so, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, but it's just as fascinating. But also, there was the newness surrounding also, with, and, then, and I, was, I was being trained in how to... Um, to uh, to use them and clean the stuff, mm -hmm. and actually enjoy the process. Then it became uh, very yeah. meditative. Yeah. Eventually, after the third month of doing it, oh, I could do this. I, I just realized like it's uh, having as artists we're handling like very um, uh, we can handle things really heavily and rough uh, and, and just with drawn and rawness and rough things. But we are capable of handling handling things delicately, mm -hmm. and then so. During that process, I had to handle caring for it really with delicacy and holding and going and slowly. So um, there was a sort of freedom into it, and then just just discovering and then also, and um, as somebody who's interested in nature and sustainability, also like, look at all this plastic waste that mm -hmm. we're dealing with, and then then this material is not really like sustainable. So. Um, so all those things um, in the going, think you're thinking about 
um, uh, looking at nature and looking at our role in it and looking at where we are during the pandemic and then and thinking at the same time like how we as artists you know where our roles in it or, or the images that uh, create uh, we make for this um, you know right then I, I'm an artist also who was you know kind of like really like has to do my part to care for a relative as well but then how what bogged me down is how can I work with you know if I'm like if I psychically I'm weighed down by this experience so so that's um, mm. like and I'm just grateful that I uh, that I had the chance to be able to um, to uh, have that experience as well and, and then has still be able to work and otherwise I wouldn't have uh, arrived at the series so um, it's um, yeah. Yeah, I was actually um, confused by the imagery in terms of how she got it. And I'm glad you, you explained it. You probably explained it in the description there. But I was thinking it looked like um, you took like black and white photographs and added a color, like a duotone or something, which I said, oh, you could do that in like Photoshop or something, you know? But Hearing the process and hearing how you find how you find the imagery is pretty fascinating. You know, in terms of you know, as a, a, I do some photography too, but I'm like I was confused in how how you got those particular images with the iPhone. <laughs> the yeah, images, you can change. You know, it shoots in color. Well, the only, yeah, but the only thing with the iPhone, they're not like, I really, I, I try to see if I can shoot, uh, shoot, like, print them larger. It's going to be blurry. Yeah. It's not as sharp, but maybe that's okay. Maybe yeah. that's, uh, it's just the nature of, uh, like, the, uh, due to the material that I used. If I shot, probably, I'm only a professional photographer, and maybe it's a different story, and I can actually. In terms of your materials, your, I don't know, when you, when you mentioned the x-rays, that kind of, because you, you decided to print on the aluminum rather than, you know, print on paper yeah. or something. There's something about that material that, yeah, there's something, yeah, there's yes, it's illuminated yeah. from within a little mm -hmm. bit more than something that's, that's printed on paper for me. Um, I think it kind so of feels like putting something up against the light. Um, so, yeah, that. That was just one comment I had, and then is it, are you're specific about the, the scale, like the dimensions that you use? Are you not? The, um, like sort of. I if, I really was curious of having it printed in the size of the phone uh -huh. that they use, but uh, this company didn't print it that small. small. But I would really want to see how it looks to right. to the yeah. size. Um, I've had something printed smaller, like eight by ten. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually I feel it's more successful because that because we're closer to the size of an iPad. Yeah, and that's eliminated so, too. Uh, that's eliminated. Yeah. Yes. So um, interesting. So it's um, so that's still uh, in, in the process of how I as far as display for this. I have one more comment about just mm -hmm. sort of intentionality because mm -hmm. you were talking about how I think I'm saying this correctly, we felt sort of lucky or fortunate mm -hmm. to have this moment to do something different. Mm -hmm. But I think that one thing I've learned for myself but I see in lots of other artists is, is that um, that character that you have to, to recognize a moment, to reinvent the way you make, you know, that moment can be ignored just as easily as grass. Oh. And so I want to congratulate that intentionality. Um, certainly I've learned over life, you can decide to make art no matter where you are economically or physically. You reinvent how you make and what you make. And so I just want to honor that moment for you where you decided to grab the moment and create something within that environment. Oh, okay. Thank you. Maybe we didn't re reach the crisis level of like, you know, but there's there's yeah. one where uh, you still have a bit of spirit or like mm -hmm. there's positivity of it. I have 
my my artist coven here, like yes. <laughs> yes. Or I have my artist friends who I cry to, and then then you'll feel better. But uh, it's it's I, I'm sure that there are, I mean there will be a, a stage where you know it's just too dark to, and then you'll have to wait. You'll have to wait when it clears up, and then you'll have more clarity. Um, you know, so uh, I am just grateful to like my artist friends uh, that uh, that really uh, that's with each other. We really, we lift the veil of uncertainty and doubt because a lot of us are going through the same way, and some are probably going you know being alleviated a little bit from the crisis, or some are still. So it helps to just to to clear clear out that fog <laughs> and sure. to see beyond it and see that. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's something in our practice that can actually, uh, there's clues to it and how to resist or to, uh, you know, to, to see past the, past that moment that we're all living through. Mm -hmm. So I guess and to encompass it too. Yeah. What? And to encompass it to, to uh, yeah. allow it in. Yeah. Yeah. It. Totally. Embrace it. And they embrace it. Yeah. Well, that seems like a nice, beautiful place to end. Um, so thank you so much, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really wonderful talk and what a wonderful audience. Yeah, the artist coven. Uh, come back, please. Our next talk will be March 22nd. And then our final talk will be, I think, I believe it's April 19th. But, um, you know, we'll give you updates through our social media. Um, and hopefully a little email blast here or there. Um, yeah. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Megan, again. Um, you. And yeah, thank you, everyone who came to, to see the talk. Thank you. Thank you.